Wow. Well, it's good to see you here this morning. And I, I don't know about you, but I know it's, uh, we're in that time of worship and just kind of uh, getting before God and, and just realizing and remembering uh, just what God has done in our life and, and just the, uh, the price that Jesus paid for us and, and all of that. Um, you know, it, it makes it a little bit, obviously, we're, we're in that attitude of worship and it's kind of somber and um, but then at the same time, then it also makes us happy, right? I don't know about you, but I'm happy that God took care of that, that God took care of what I couldn't take care of. And actually, um, we're, we've been on this series called Happy, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, talk a little bit about sin uh, a little bit more, uh, which is funny because um, even when I was uh, uh, preparing the message, I, I usually prepare my messages uh, a week in advance. I'm usually uh, a week out. And, um, and so even as I was preparing the message, I didn't even, I totally forgot about communion. And you know, God has it all, all uh, figured out and has it all together. And, and so um, he ties it all together, uh, what I missed and, and those things. But we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, this morning. Um, but we've been on this series called Happy. And, and we've been talking about just this whole idea that every single person on the face of this earth, I mean, we want to be happy, right? Every single one of us want to be happy. I mean, we think about happy-go-lucky. We, we think about happily, happily ever after. We want to live happily ever after. I mean, we think about uh, trigger happy. Oh, wait, no, that's probably not a good one. That's, <laughs> you probably don't want to be trigger happy. Uh, we think about, uh, uh, you know, just being happy. We think about all of those things. Um, we think about finding that happy medium, right? We think about when we have a little conflict, maybe with our spouse or with a friend, we want to find that happy medium. Uh, we think about a happy hour. Uh, maybe that's not another one to think, think of either. Um, but the fact of the matter is we want to be happy, don't we? I mean, we don't want to walk around. We really don't want to walk around and be sad. We really don't want to walk around and be aggravated. We don't want to be discouraged. Now, there are times that we are um, but we don't want to live that way. We don't want that to be, uh, to, to make up who we are. Now, here's the thing that we've made very clear in this series, a couple things that we've made very clear in this series, that true happiness cannot be found apart from God. That true happiness can only be found in God. See, because if we don't have God, we won't have true happiness. And not only will we not have true happiness, but happiness in our lives will only be temporary. Happiness in our lives will only be momentary. And so in other words, we'll be happy one moment. And then just like we said, we all get discouraged at times. We all get sad at times. We all get upset at times. Well, whatever it is, that person, that place or that thing that gets us in that state, then in that moment, we're feeling that. And then maybe something else will happen and we're happy again. But here's what we found in this series. And, and I, pray that, I pray that if you haven't been with us or even if you have, man, go to our website. If you've missed part one and part two, or even if you watched it, heard it, uh, you were here, whatever, go back and listen to it again. Watch it again. Because I pray that we could take this, this true happiness that we've talked about and that we could apply this to our life. Because I'm telling you, it'll, it'll turn our world upside down in a great way. It'll do something awesome in our life that God wants to happen. In, in our lives. Because again, if we're just living moment by moment, again, happiness is just temporary as far as our culture is concerned. Our culture is concerned and, and as far as our society knows happiness to be. But even in the midst of the struggle and even in the midst of the situations, the hardships, even in the midst of the sad time, even in the midst of the mad time, even in the midst of discouragement, we can still be happy when, first off, we have God in our life and we're allowing him to impact our lives, to influence our lives, we could still be happy through those situations because we know the God that has everything under control and that he's going to take care of all of those things. So here's what we've been doing, right? We've been looking at different verses where David writes throughout the Psalms. And I would encourage you sometime, I mean, maybe this could be a Bible study for you. Go throughout Psalms and see all the places where, J where David says, blessed is the person, blessed is the person, blessed is the man, blessed is the one. And Jesus even did this on the Sermon on the Mount. When he was preaching that sermon, Jesus is like, blessed is this person, blessed is that person. And we see why they're blessed. I mean, David goes on and Jesus goes on. And so we're going to look at another aspect of where David writes, blessed is the person. And remember, this word blessed, 
It means happy, and that's what we found out in part one, that it means happy, but it goes much deeper than that because it not only means happy, but it actually also means stable, and that's what helps us in those unhappy times, in those discouraging times, in those times of hardship when we can still be stable because we realize we're not relying upon just this emotion of happiness, but that we're relying on actually true happiness that God gives us, and it keeps us level, and not only does it keep us level and stable, but it also keeps us going forward that the discouragement and that the sadness and that some of those things won't knock us down and and won't keep us down but that we'll remember that we have this God that's on our side and we will continue to move forward so we're going to see this word blessed or or this word happy or this word stable that means stable level going forward we're going to see it again I want you to notice this David writes in Psalm 32 starting in verse 1 notice this David writes, blessed is the person whose disobedience is forgiven and whose sin is pardoned. Blessed is the person whom the Lord no longer accuses of sin and who has no deceitful thoughts. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm just thinking, man, yeah, that person is blessed. That has all of their sin forgiven. That has all of their mistakes uh, just wiped out. That has all of their all of their failures pardoned. That blessed is that person. I mean, how incredible is that? And just as we were already talking about in uh, with with communion and what the bread and the juice represents, that you know that this is what Jesus did for us. And blessed is that person. And I'm just thinking, man, I want to be that person. Like, because I know, I know me. You, you know me a little bit. I know me. I really know me. You know me somewhat. And some of you that are some of my closest friends, you know me. You know me quite a bit. But I really know me. I know my mistakes. I know my failures. I know the things that I've done. And, and I know the things that I've, I make mistakes from time to time that I do. And, and, and I would like to be that person. I want to be that person that's blessed that's going to be happy, that's going to, that's going to be level and going forward because my sins have been forgiven. And so I'm kind of wondering, like David is writing this and, and being a reader at that time, but then also being one of the readers, as, as you and I are reading it now, being one of the readers now and just saying, well, you know, is, is he talking about me? Is he talking about me? Because, man, I would, I would like that. I, I, I would like my sins to be pardoned. Who's David talking to? Who's David referring to? Who's David talking about? Now, again, I don't know about you, but my goodness, I mean, I don't know how somebody couldn't be absolutely thrilled with their sins being forgiven. I mean, who wouldn't be, who wouldn't be incredibly happy with all of their sin forgiven? Well, it's, it's probably the person that doesn't think that they have sin. It's probably the person that doesn't believe in sin. Now, let me, let me ask uh, those of you uh, this morning, how many of you, you, you called on the, nor- the name of the Lord and, you're, and you've been saved? You, you called on the name of Jesus Christ, you, you've been saved. You accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. Okay, there's a lot of you in here, right? There's a lot of you. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? See, here's what Paul writes in Colossians, talking about what took place in that salvation experience. Paul says this in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, God has rescued us from the power of darkness and has brought us into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ, whom he loves. His son paid the price to free us, which means that our sins are forgiven. When you accepted Jesus Christ as a savior and Lord of your life, God, as we talked about again in communion, God paid or Jesus paid for all of your sin, past, present, and even in the future, the sin that you haven't committed yet, that Jesus Christ paid for that and that you and I are forgiven and you and I have been given this new life and you and I have been given eternal life. So who wouldn't be thrilled about that? Well, again, a person that maybe doesn't believe in sin. A person that doesn't believe that there's sin in the world. Or a person that doesn't believe, a person that maybe believes that there is sin, but that doesn't believe that they have sin. And so I want to dive into that just a, a little bit because here's, here's what I want to say. Maybe you're an unchurched person. Uh, maybe you're, you don't regularly go to church. And, and again, maybe you've never given your life to, to Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. First off, let me just tell you, you're in a safe place, all right? We're not, we're not going to try to change your mind. We're not here to try. I'm not here to try to change your mind. But here's what I want you to, here's what I want to ask you to do, is just consider some things. 
I just want you to sit back and just consider some things. Consider some of the things that we're going to talk about, and more specifically, not so much what I'm going to say, but what God speaks through his word. I want you to just kind of consider some things. Because there's some people that, you know, they know that they've sinned, but they're just kind of justifying their sin. Well, you know, this person in my life, that's why I sinned. This person made me do it, you know. Like my business partner made me do it, or my spouse made me do it, or my friend made me do it, or, or because this is going on in, in the economy, you know, that's why I'm, I'm doing this. And so we have a lot of people that are walking around that they know they're, they're in sin, but then they, they believe that they're okay simply because, well, it's justified. It's justified. You know, it's justified. And then, like I said, there are some people that uh, they just don't believe in sin. Some people that believe in sin, but don't think that they actually have sin. So my question is, what is sin? You know, like, let's just start there. What, what is sin? And actually, John, one of Jesus' disciples, he writes uh, in, his own, in his own letter, his own, uh, uh, we call it a book, but it was actually a letter that was written to a group of people or to a church. And uh, he writes in 1 John five seventeen, every kind of wrongdoing is sin. Now, that's good to know. Sin is wrongdoing. Wrongdoing is sin. That's good to know. But it really doesn't help me out all that much. Like, okay, well, sin is wrongdoing, so I know kind of what sin is. What the heck is wrongdoing, right? I mean, we're just kind of getting a little basic here, but, but stay with me. So what is, what is wrongdoing? Well, Paul get, lays out a list. Paul, the apostle, lays out a list, and if you know anything about the apostle Paul, he wrote most of the New Testament. And if you're somebody that, that hates Christians, Paul started out that way. Paul started out hating Christians. He threw Christians in, in prison. He wanted nothing to do with this whole Jesus movement. And, and then Paul just had this dramatic and just had this incredible encounter with the risen Jesus Christ, and it turned his world upside down. And so then Paul gets saved, and, and then he begins to travel and begins to tell people about Christ, and, and not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles or the non-Jews. And, and, and Paul is out there. And so here in his life, uh, or at this time of his life, Paul is writing letters to churches that he started as he traveled. And so he writes this letter to the Galatians, and here's what he talks about as it relates to what is wrongdoing. I mean, and maybe we're wondering, like, okay, what is wrongdoing? Because I guarantee you, there are probably a good majority of us, there are three things, probably like the top three that we think of as, okay, yeah, that's sin, right? We think of, all right, drugs. Okay, well, I'm not doing drugs, so, you know, I I'm okay, I haven't sinned. You know, or we think about getting drunk. Okay, well, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't get drunk. So, I, hey, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't sinned. Or we think about, um, we think about sex. We think about sexual immorality. Okay, and, and, and so we're kind of like, okay, well, those are the top three. Hey, you know what? I'm cool. You know, I don't do those things. So I'm, I'm not, I, I haven't sinned. I've never made a mistake. I've never, I've never failed in any way. But I want you to notice, because not only are those three in this list, but I want you to notice what else is in, in this list that Paul reveals as wrongdoing or as sin. We pick this up in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Notice Paul says, now the effects, that word effects is the word, um, it also mean, means works. It also means deeds or doings. He says, now the doings of the corrupt nature, talking about our sinful a, f a fleshly nature, our fleshly nature, or, or this, this, uh, this body is referred to in the Bible as a corrupt nature because it's, 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 uh, it's fallible, it's frail. And so Paul says, now the effects or the doings of the corrupt nature, they're obvious. Now notice the list. He says, here's what wrongdoing is. Here's what sin is. Illicit sex, you know, just like going all, all over the place with sex. Perversion of any kind, promiscuity, idolatry, drug use, Hatred. I mean, you got drug use and hatred is right next to it. I mean, how's that for a shocker? It's like, oh yeah, you know, drug use. Oh yeah, that's bad. That's evil. That's... Well, what about hatred? Have you ever hated somebody? He says rivalry. This word rivalry is kind of like the physical, actually getting physical with somebody. So physically, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, physical fighting, if you will. Uh, jealousy, angry outbursts, selfish ambition, conflict. This word conflict is actually more of the verbal fighting. Okay, you're verbally fighting with somebody. Uh, factions, that's cliques, all right? Creating cliques. Envy, drunkenness, drunkenness while partying. So notice all the things that are mixed in with kind of the top three that maybe we think of, or, or the top five that we say, oh yeah, that's a sin, that's a sin, I stay away from that. But again, I mean, we, let's just be honest. 
Let's just be honest. And again, you may, you may not believe that sin exists. Or, or you may believe that you've never sinned. Or maybe you're just kind of justifying it. But the reality is this, is that sin does exist and that sin is very real. And that wrongdoing does exist in, in our world. And even though our world, here's what our culture does, right? Our culture says, well, right is wrong and wrong is right. That's what our culture says. And so we've got a bunch of people in our world, a bunch of people in our country, a bunch of people in our cities all around the world that are just, you know, just totally confused as to what is right, what is wrong. I mean, I, I think that's right. I think that's good. I think that's, that's right. And, and so we, we got all these mixed messages, all these mixed ideas as to what is right and what is wrong. And Paul is laying it out and he's saying, here it is, wrongdoing, sin, here it is. Let me ask you something. Have you ever had hatred towards somebody? Have you ever been jealous of somebody? I mean, when you were a kid, weren't you jealous of the one, the one kid that, you know, they got the award and you didn't? It was just like, oh, man, you know, I should have gotten that. Why did he get it, you know? Or, or being the, the uh, it was one of your peers in, in, in school that got picked to do, uh, take the attendance down to the office. Did any of you do that? Where, I think it was elementary school, we did that, where uh, the teacher would take attendance and then uh, she would pick one of the students to take the attendance down to the office. And, and if you didn't get picked and you got jealous about it, like, well, how come he get to do it? I never get to take the attendance down. I never get to go to the office. You know, and then if you were really good, you know, you could kind of sneak around school a little bit, then get back to the classroom. But, but have you ever been jealous? Have you ever been envious of somebody? Because point blank, I mean, when you look at, when you look at these things, have you ever been selfish? Because point blank, that's wrongdoing. That's sin. Now, now, I'm not saying all of that to, to condemn you and to condemn myself in any way, to judge you or to judge myself in any way. I'm going somewhere with this, so hang tight. But here's what Paul says. Paul says, here is, here's the list of wrongdoings. Now, notice this, because he goes on, he says, all right, there, it's obvious. The wrongdoings are obvious. You got illicit sex, perversion, promiscuity, idolatry, drug use, hatred, rivalry, jealousy, angry outbursts, selfish ambition, conflict, factions, envy, drunkenness, while partying. And he says, and similar things. So anything similar to this, anything similar to any of that on the list, any of those things on the list, is wrongdoing or is sin. He goes on to say, he says, I've told you in the past, and I'm telling you again, and specifically he's telling this group of people, and obviously uh, not even knowing that he's writing to, to us, also speaking to us. I've told you in the past, and I'm telling you again, that people who do these kinds of things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, sin is wrongdoing, and wrongdoing will block you from God's best for your life. See, Paul said, you know, if, if we continue in this, if we continue doing wrong, whichever one of those wrongs are on that list, if we're consistent at that, then it's going to block us. It's going to block our lives from receiving the best that God has for us and the best that God wants to bring into our lives. It's going gonna, it's gonna to block it. In other words, I kind of think of like LeBron James. I mean, one of the best basketball, basketball players playing in the NBA, second to Michael Jordan, because Michael Jordan is still the greatest basketball player that ever played the game. All right. But, but one thing about LeBron James is, man, that dude can block, man. He's a shot blocker. I mean, among, I mean what, can, what position can't he play? If you, if you, any of you watch basketball? Anybody watch basketball? All right, some of you. So, I mean, it's like, what position can he play? I mean, he is, he's awesome in, in, in every, every aspect of the game. But one of the things that he does well also is, is blocking shots. And, and so here's the shooter. He's making his way down the court, and that's uh, Jalen Rose on the Chicago Bulls there that's having his shot blocked by LeBron James. And, and here's LeBron James. He comes in. He swats that thing away. Get that out of here. Not in my house. You know, he's just blocking, blocking balls. And you see highlights of him just blocking shots, incredible ones. Well, think of that in the sense of what we're talking about with sin blocking God's very best. Because just like LeBron James is blocking people's shots, sin is blocking God's best from your life and from my life. See, it's not that, God is, it's not that God's holding back his be best from you and me. 
It's not that God says, well, you know, nah, she, he doesn't deserve it, so nope, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give it to her. I'm gonna hold back. I'm gonna keep that back. It's not, it has nothing to do with that. It, it has nothing to do with how long you've been a Christian or how long you haven't or has nothing to do with any of that. What it has to do with the majority of the times, aside from, which we talked about in, in, uh, week one, aside from being patient and waiting on the Lord, what it has to do with the majority of the times is there might be some sin that is blocking God's best from our life. And we just have to be real about that. We just have to be, we just have to be honest about that, that there is actually something going on, that there's actually something that's happening in our lives that might be blocking God's best from our life. Because actually Paul even writes this in Romans uh, 6.21 Paul says this, he says, what did you gain by doing those things? The wrong, the, the wrongdoing, that, the list that he gave, the sin. He said, what did you gain by doing those things? Again, sin blocking God's best. What did you gain? Now, Christians, those of you that have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, you know this very well, what Paul is getting ready to say. He says, you're ashamed of what you used to do. Every single one of us came to that place where we were ashamed of the mistakes that we made, that we were ashamed of the wrong that we did, maybe how we wronged certain people, maybe uh, just the way that we lived our life and, and, and just the attitude, the behaviors that we had, whatever it might be. But every single one of us came to that place where we were ashamed. And those of you that just, you know, you, you, maybe, again, you're, you're just not sure if sin is real or, or if you believe in it or, or what Jesus did, at some point, you're going to come to that realization. You're going to say, wow, you know what? That was messed up what I did. That was messed up what I did to that person or how I treated them or, or even how I treated God. Notice what Paul continues to say. He says, you're ashamed of what you used to do because it ended in death. He said, and the result of that, that thing or those things or that wrongdoing was death. Now, John writes uh, again, I believe it's in, in 1 John, but John writes again. He says that there is sin that leads to death and there is sin that doesn't lead to death. Now, all sin, if we continue in it, all sin will eventually lead to death. In other words, we will shorten the very life that God had for us to live, the, the amount of years that God uh, uh, planned for us to have on this earth, we will shorten that by allowing sin in our life. Again, sin blocking uh, God's very best. And, but, but the point being is this, is that John says, you know, there's sin that does lead to death, like immediate death, immediately, but then there is sin that doesn't lead to death, but will eventually lead to death. And so here's Paul. He's saying, you know, you, you were ashamed of it, and you realize that it, it brought some type of death in your life. Now, maybe it wasn't a physical death right away, but maybe it brought an end to your marriage because of the choices that you made, because of your foolishness. Maybe, maybe it brought an end to your job because you did something stupid. You know, maybe you were stealing uh, from, your, from your boss or something along those lines, or maybe you were cooking up the books or something along those lines. And so it ended your job, your career ended in death simply because you did something wrong or I did something wrong. So again, when Paul's saying, you know, you're ashamed of it because it ended in, in death, he's not, not just talking about physical death. And even more importantly, he's saying it resulted in some type of death in your life. Why? Because sin is poison. Sin is poison. And all sin does in our life is poison it. And as soon as we introduce it, yeah, it's, it's fun. I mean, we said that last week. It's fun for, for a time. Like when you start, start out in sin, you start doing it, it's like, oh, hey, there's no effect. Oh, this is good. Nothing bad's happening to me. And that's, the, that's, the, that's the, the, the power of sin, if you will. That's the trickery of sin is that it comes in and everything is okay and everything is good, and then it bites like a viper. It bites like a snake, and it takes a chunk out of your life and out of my life, or it brings poison into your life and into my life. And this is what Paul's saying. He's saying, you see that list? If you give, if you give yourself on a regular basis to that, it's going to come back on you, and it's going to bite you. It's going to bite your life. It's going to destroy whatever it can. It's going to destroy your relationships. It's going to destroy your finances. It's going to destroy your body. It's going to destroy you, and it's going to block God's best from your life. See, here's the thing. 
is sin ultimately isn't interested in taking hostages. It wants casualties. See, sin isn't interested in taking POWs. Sin isn't interested in taking people into captivity. That's not what sin wants. Now, sin will take you and I into captivity, but the end result is sin wants to kill you. And more importantly than that, the one that's behind it, the one that's behind sin, Satan himself, the devil himself, is the one that's working all of that out. He, above anybody else, wants you to be destroyed. He wants your life to be ended. He wants you to be disconnected from God. He doesn't even want you and I to know God. Satan is the one that's behind it all, and he is the one that wants to steal, kill, and destroy your life and my life. Sin ultimately isn't interested. It's not interested in taking hostages. Nope. It wants casualties. Now, take all of that. Take all of that. Because here, I mean, it's very clear to me. And like I said, I just, I don't, I'm not trying to change your mind if you're, if you're not sure about sin, if it's real, if you believe in it or whatever. I'm not trying to change your mind. I just want you to consider some things. Because there is wrongdoing in our world. There actually is wrongdoing in our world. There's actually bad stuff that's happening. And we could turn a blind eye to it. And we could say, no, it's, it's not happening. And, 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 and society does this great job in a bad way, this great job of pulling the wool over our eyes and, and, and using smoke and mirrors and, and allowing us not to really, really see that there, there is evil, that there is perversity, there, there is wickedness. Now let's go back to what David was writing. I want you to pick up on a couple things here. With all that we said, look at what David writes back at Psalm 32, verse 1. A psalm by David, a maskil. Now, I don't know about you. When I looked at that word, I was like, what in the world is a maskil? All right, so I had to look it up. See, I'm not ashamed of that. I can go, I can research it. So I studied it. I researched it. I looked it up. A maskil is a didactic writing, or didactic just simply means an instructive writing, okay? So in other words, David had a purpose for his writing. It wasn't just a funny story. It wasn't, he wasn't just uh, telling a story or writing some type of a drama. David had a reason for writing what he wrote, not just to his readers at that time, but uh, to, to us today as we read it. And so David is writing this in such a way that it would instruct. But not only was it for the purpose of instructing, but also for the purpose of instructing so that it would make you and I think. It would make his readers think. In other words, things that make you go, hmm, right? And that's what David wanted to do here. David's writing this, and he wants us to think about it. He doesn't want us just to read it, and he wants us to actually think about the words that he's putting down because he's, he's trying to introduce some, something. He's trying to teach something. He's trying to reveal something, and he wants us to consider it. He wants us to think about it. So notice, David says, bless, happy, well off, prosperous, going forward, stable is the person whose disobedience is forgiven and whose sin is pardoned. Blessed is the person whom the Lord no longer accuses of sin and who has no deceitful thoughts. When I kept silent, notice this, he goes on, when I kept silent about my sins, my bones began to weaken because my groaning all day long. In other words, David is saying the same thing that, uh, that both John and even Paul writes in the New Testament, that David realized right away, uh, something's happening, something's not right. Something's not good here after I've done my sin. And notice that David says, you know, I, I, I held on to I kept silent my sin. I didn't do anything about it. I just kind of kept it away and, and, and didn't say anything about it. And he started to notice that he was weakening. He started to notice that something, that something that wasn't so good was happening in his life. And it was because of the sin, David realizes. So again, he says, when I kept silent about my sins, my bones began to weaken because, my groan, because of my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand lay heavily on me. My, my strength shriveled in the summer heat. David realizes he's getting weak. Now he says something right after that. You see the word selah? That word selah means pause. In other words, David wants us to pause for just a moment and consider what you just read. Consider what you just heard. Because he's going somewhere. somewhere. Remember, he's, he wants to introduce something. He wants to instruct us on something. So David says, all right, I told you that. Now pause for a second. Now don't read any further. Don't cheat. But David says, pause. Now, 
Okay, let's recap. What did David say? David said, man, I kept, I kept it hidden. I sinned and I knew I sinned. I made a mistake. I did some wrong, some, something wrong and I knew I did. And I kept it hidden. I kept it locked up. And I noticed that something was happening inside of my life. I noticed that I was getting weak. I noticed that there was some death, some poison that was being introduced, David says. And then he goes on. He says, so I decided I made my sins known to you. And I did not cover up my guilt. I decided to confess them to you, O Lord. And then you forgave all my sin. And David says, Selah, pause. Pause right there. Think about what you just read. Because David, he was hiding it. And then he says, you know what I did? Because I realized, man, death is happening. I don't want this any longer. So I said, God, here it is. Here's what I did, God. Here's the wrong that I did. Here's the mistakes that I made. Here are the failures that I made, God. I just want to confess it. I want to get it out in the open. I want to, I want to get rid of it. And David noticed immediately as soon as he confessed it. And John even says this in, in 1 John. He says, if we will confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And immediately David says, oh Lord, then you forgave all of my sins. See, I don't care what you've done. Honestly, I don't care. Because God has forgiven you. Jesus Christ paid the price so you and I would be forgiven so that we can be set free and so that we can have eternal life. David says, pause, think about that. Think about how incredible that is that God would actually want to forgive our sin." continue on uh, verse six for this reason let all godly people pray to you god when you may be found then the raging flood water will not reach them you are my hiding place you protect me from trouble you surround me with joyous songs of salvation david says man why wouldn't i want you you're the one that's my protection you're the one that's going to save me you're the one that even in the midst of unhappiness going on around me you're going to keep me happy simply because you're going to save me you're going to deliver me you're going to protect me god now notice because David started to hear God's voice because David says, hey, here's what the Lord says. And it's in, it's in quotes there, meaning that David heard the voice of God. God was speaking to David. And here's what God tells David, again, for not only for David's sake, but also for us. He says, and, and there again, there's the pause, Selah, you see it? Consider what you, just, what you just read. But notice he says, the Lord says, I will instruct you. I will teach you the way that you should go. I will advise you as my eyes watch over you. He says, don't be stubborn like a horse or a mule. They need a bit and a bridle. Triple crown, anybody watch a triple crown? All right, they need a bit and a bridle. And <laughs> don't be stubborn like a horse or a mule. They need a bit and a bridle in their mouth to restrain them or they will not come near you. And here's what we've been talking about in this series, right? If we don't have God, we don't have true happiness. And if we don't have his counsel and his, and his advice, his wisdom in our lives, we're not going to be happy, friends. And we're seeing it again. God tells David, David, I'll instruct you. He's telling us, I'll teach you. I'll be there for you. I'll lead you. I'll guide you every step of the way. Notice this. Many, many heartaches await wicked people, but mercy surrounds those who trust the Lord. Many pain, hardship away wicked people. Why? Because again, sin's blocking the very best from your life. But mercy surrounds those who trust the Lord. Be glad and find joy in the Lord, you righteous people. Notice, notice the happy terms, right? Be glad, find joy. You righteous people, sing with joy. All right, there's all the happiness. All whose motives are decent. Now here, let's, we gotta, gotta wrap this up. But Here's the, here's the reality, friends, is that actually uh, Peter, Peter writes that love covers many sins in, in 1 Peter 4.8. And God, uh, John also says that God is love. And so God loved the world that he sent his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. See, you and I, we don't have to live in death any longer. We don't have to have death any longer. We could be redeemed, we could be set free, we can be saved, all because of God. So remember earlier when I was saying, when David said, you know, man, blessed is the person that God pardons their sin, forgives their sin, you know, just wipes away their sin. I, I would love to be that person. Guess what? You and I are those people and every person on the face of this earth that God says, I took care of it. 
I sent my son to take care of it. In fact, uh, Paul writes this in Romans 6.23. Paul says, the payment for sin is death. You and I, and, we, and we've probably seen this in our lives, we've paid a terrible price for sin, haven't we? I mean, the sin that, is, that we've allowed in our lives from time to time, and that's what it's talking about. Paul says the payment for sin is death, but the gift that God freely gives, because it's not a gift if it's not free, the gift that God freely gives is everlasting life found in Christ Jesus our Lord. That everlasting life he's talking about is not just eternal life, but he's talking about perpetual, ongoing life right now. He's talking about, I've got the very best. God has the very best for you. Don't let sin block. Don't let sin block the best that God has for you. In other words, true happiness is embracing God's love and accepting Jesus' sacrifice for my sins. So the question, the question that I want to ask us this morning is let's just be honest. Can we be honest? Because if we're gonna if we're gonna fool ourselves, if we're gonna lie to ourselves and say that there's really no sin or that sin hasn't affected our lives from, from time to time, then we're gonna stay in this kind of this blindness state that our world is in. That just says, Oh no, everything goes. Yeah, everything's right, everything's good, and good is bad, and bad is good, and right is wrong, and wrong is right, and yeah, it doesn't matter. You know, you can do whatever you want. Oh yeah, if it's you know, if somebody gets upset because you did something to them, that's their problem. You know, if, if it's right for you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's wrong for them. That's our, that's our world's thinking, friends. That's our world's thought process. And, and we become so accustomed, our, our, uh, the world, people have become so accustomed to it that we don't know that there is any better because we haven't actually we haven't actually uh, been able to see the better and more specifically the best that God has for us. And so there again, what sin is blocking me? You make that personal just like I gotta make it personal. What sin is blocking me from living happily ever after? See, because yeah, God wants you to be happy. But true happiness is found in Him, not in all the ideas and what our society says that happiness is. And, so our society says that we should do. So you be honest about that this morning because I want you and I want myself. Man, whatever is holding me back, like David said, man, I don't want to keep it. I don't want to hold on to it. I just want to say, God, here it is. I made the mistake. And God, I just want to confess it. I just want to get rid of it and know that I received that forgiveness and know that I'm having his best in my life. That as he's speaking into my life, as he's influencing my life, as he's guiding my life, that God is bringing the very best in my life. So right where you are, close your eyes for just a second. God, I thank you for every single person that's here. And right where you are, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and you'd like to do that this morning, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm not going to call you up. I just want to pray with you. And so if that's you this morning, would you just slip your hand up right where you are? You just say, Josh, you know, I've never given my life to Jesus. I see that hand. Thank you for your boldness. I see that hand. Thank you for your boldness. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? You say, Josh, I've never given my life to Jesus, and I want to do that. That's the first step, friends. That's the first step. And maybe you've been far from God for a while, and you've allowed sin to creep in. You say, Josh, I need to rededicate my life to Jesus. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up right where you are? Just slip your hand up. I don't want to miss anybody. I see that hand in the back. Thank you. All right, right where you are, and even if you didn't raise your hand, right where you are, you say, Josh, I need, I need Jesus in my life. I need to dedicate my life to him. I need to rededicate my life to him. Right where you are, would you just pray this prayer uh, with me? And, and I want just everybody to just pray this prayer. Let's, let's pray in faith uh, with these people that, that are praying. Just say, God, right now, I thank you that you sent your son, that you so loved the world, that Jesus Christ, you came to this earth and you paid for my sin and that you gave me a new life and that you gave me eternal life and that you forgave me of everything that I've ever done wrong. Jesus, right now, 
I confess you as the Savior and the Lord of my life. God, I thank you for saving me, for forgiving me, for giving me Jesus. And God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit and for your word, the Bible. And I ask you, God, to open up your word to me and to guide my life by it each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God, I thank you for every single, yeah, yeah, give him praise. God, I thank you for every single person that raised their hand that said, Jesus, be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Forgive me of all of my sin. And God, right now, I just pray that for every one of us, that if there's any sin that is blocking us, that is blocking your best from entering our life, right now, God, we just confess it. Right now, we just get rid of it. We just say, God, I confess that sin. I want to get rid of that failure. I want to get rid of that mistake. I don't want that thing to have any presence in my life any longer. I don't want it to to introduce and and to keep poisoning my life any longer. I refuse it. I get rid of it. Jesus Christ, I thank you. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. I receive your power over that sin. And God, give me, give us your very best. Give us, Lord. We want your very best for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen, yeah. Yeah, let's give him praise. Man, he's awesome.